A man armed with two pistols this morning went on a shooting spree in two Arkansas towns, killing seven people and wounding four others. Police say the suspect, Gene Simmons, had just... Tonight we are learning more head. about an alleged murder for hire plot in Hot Springs. His mother tells me she can't believe what has happened in her small community. Brand new video just in from inside an Arkansas nightclub where a shooter opened fire. Have a location in rural Crawford County to where the possible location of Cassie may be located. In Bentonville, Arkansas, the hometown of Walmart, a trial is about to begin over the mysterious death of a former police officer at a local residence. I'm your host, Nikki T, and you're listening to Strictly Homicide, an Arkansas true crime podcast that discusses lesser-known cases out of the natural state. Thanks for listening to another episode of Strictly Homicide. I also want to say thank you to all our patrons and everyone who's rated and reviewed the show. Please make sure to stay tuned at the end of the episode to hear a few promos from some of my favorite podcasts. Warning, Strictly Homicide covers cases that involve sexual assault, violence, and homicide. Episodes may contain explicit language and are not suitable for young ears. Listener discretion is advised. Today's episode starts our cold case series, and I'll be sharing the stories of Mary Shin, who was referred to by Bobo to everyone who knew her, and Samantha Olson. In both cases, the communities they occurred in have so many questions and little to no answers. The first case took place in North Little Rock, which we've already talked about, so I wanted to give some interesting facts about Samantha Olson's hometown, Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Pine Bluff's population is just under 50,000 and is situated in the southeast section of the Arkansas Delta. The city's wealth was based on the sales of cotton, and by 1860, Pine Bluff had the highest number of slaves in Arkansas. During World War II, the Army built Grider Field Airport, where air cadets would attend flight training. Army Air Corps trained approximately 9,000 pilots before it closed in 1944. On December 2nd in 1942, the Army broke ground for Pine Bluff Arsenal on 15,000 acres. Our local television station, KATV, was once housed in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, and in 1953 they aired Arkansas's first VHF broadcast. In 1957, the Kraft Paper Mill opened in Pine Bluff, and not long after, International Paper Company opened up five miles east of the city. Both mills brought in many jobs, along with a horrible odor. The first time I went to Pine Bluff, I did not know that they had paper mills there, or that they smelt so bad. In 1958, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke to the students at Arkansas AMNN which is now University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. Pine Bluff has a handful of notable people, including Olympic gold medalist Charles Green, the first African-American to create a coin for the U.S., Isaac Scott Hathaway, Bobby Hutton, a founding member of the Black Panther Party, architect and designer E. Fay Jones, neuroscientist Teresa A. Jones, Razorback and tight end for Washington Redskins Jeremy Sprinkle, and Krista White, winner of America's Next Top Model Cycle 14. Oh, and Mr. T. No, not that one. My Mr. T, who was born in Pine Bluff. Our second case takes place in a much smaller city named Magnolia. The population is just over 11,000 and is home to the World Championship State Cook-Off, which has been featured on the Food Network and attracts over 40,000 attendees. The city was tiny with a population under 2,000 just before March 1938 when the discovery of oil occurred. The Magnolia oil field was the largest producing oil field in volumes during the early years of World War II, but in March 2013, more than 5,000 barrels of oil leaked out from the Lion Oil Trading and Transportation Storage Tank. This caused oil to flow all the way into the bayou. Magnolia's list of notable people is smaller than Pine Bluff, but so is the population and the town. Some notable people include Arkansas entrepreneur Harvey C. Couch, who controlled a regional utility and railroad empire, former wide receiver in the NFL Roy Green, who played for St. Louis, Phoenix, and Philadelphia, 
and probably the coolest notable person to me, Charlene Harris, who wrote the Sookie Steakhouse novels, which was the basis for HBO's True Blood. Both cases are unique, and both cases have very little evidence. The communities which these cases took place have both been left with terror, knowing that the culprit in each case is still out there. Both cases are in desperate need of any information, so if you or someone you know has any information or tips on either of these cases, please contact the proper authorities. I remember my family and I were in the car a block away from the intersection where the first case occurred. August 14, 2013 was a normal day for Samantha and Eric Olson. Samantha and Linnea Olson were heading to pick up a gift for a birthday party that they would be attending in her hometown. Eric, Samantha's husband, was at work at the Copper Grill in Little Rock. Samantha was heading east on McCain Boulevard when she stopped at a red light at the intersection of JFK and McCain. The light changed to green and Samantha went on her way. Within seconds, Samantha was hit with a bullet and her car coasted to the front of Starbucks. This was the very Starbucks that I visited every morning. Now, every time I go in that store, I can't help but think of somebody that I never met. Samantha was born October 27th in 1981 in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. She played softball and danced with a professional instructor for 10 years. She attended and graduated from Pine Bluff High School in 1999. She had one younger sister named April, and her mother said that she possessed a sweetness that was manifested in her kindness to people and animals. She was extremely passionate about animal rescues. In 2008, Samantha lived in North Little Rock and attended University of Arkansas in Little Rock. She was about to start a new job at Cajun's Wharf. A few others started the same day as Samantha, but no one caught her eye like Eric Olson. The two hit it off, and their friendship grew into a romantic relationship. Samantha graduated from the University of Arkansas Little Rock with a degree in accounting, and she then got a full-time accounting job. Samantha had suffered a few miscarriages, so when she found out she was pregnant in 2001, she was nervous. Eric proposed to Samantha, and they set to wed in November of 2012. Once Samantha was about six months pregnant, she began filling their baby girl's closet with clothes. On September 16th in 2012, Samantha gave birth to Lene, a beautiful, healthy baby girl. And a few months later, Samantha and Eric tied the knot. They started to discuss selling their home and buying a bigger one so they can add on to the family. Samantha's life was just perfect. The bullet went through her and the window that was partially rolled down, avoiding any shattered glass. Linnea was unharmed and Samantha was transported to UAMS. Witnesses reported seeing a 2008 maroon F-150 with a large orange toolbox in the bed of the truck. They said they saw someone point a gun out the window and fire between three to six shots. The witnesses sometimes had different descriptions of the amount of shots, the color of the toolbox, and the race of the driver. The truck never sped up and just continued down McCain Boulevard, which turned into West 47th Street as you approached Levy. The truck was spotted on a surveillance camera in Levy, turning on Camp Robinson off of West 47th Street. The very last image that a surveillance camera got was on the 3500 block of Camp Robinson. Although the video camera caught the truck, it did not capture any images of the driver or the license plate numbers. Her mother's nightly habit was to watch the news and then go to sleep. She saw the reports of the shooting and thought, that's where Samantha gets her coffee, but nothing more. Her father also saw the news and didn't think anything of it involving their child. Later that night, her father was contacted by UAMS, and on his way there, he just thought, oh no, Samantha must have got into a car accident. He arrived at UAMS, and the staff let him know they did everything that they could, but she didn't make it. Her father absolutely lost it. Not only did he lose his child, but his grandchild lost their mother. He knew he still had to contact Samantha's mom and around 10.30 p.m., he made the call. They had no suspect and no motive. All they had was a blurry video of a maroon F-150 truck. 
Police believe the murder was completely random. There have been so many theories or rumors out there from gang initiation to an accident. Or could it have been a thrill kill? It was the middle of the day. Sunset was still a good 45 minutes away. And both intersections stay busy all the time. They each have five lanes. How is there not any more witnesses or any evidence? Law enforcement seemed to have done everything that they possibly could, including a $15,000 reward. We've received hundreds of thousands of tips, Brian Diedrich, a sergeant with North Little Rock Police, said. But nothing has brought us any closer to solving this crime and finding out who shot Samantha on this Monday night. Eric said, I'm disappointed and saddened that the case remains cold. Mostly, I'm saddened that my lovely wife was gunned down in broad daylight and no one saw anything substantial enough to lead to an arrest. To those that were there at the intersection of McCain and JFK that day, I must ask how a woman could be murdered right in front of them and they see nothing. He also said, Later in the evening, trying to fall asleep, especially when I've got Linnea there, lying in bed, I'm really aware of the person that's missing. That whole atmosphere has changed. I'm not aware of how long it'll take before I don't notice that, or if I ever will stop noticing it. It's kind of crazy. November 11th, 2013 was their first year wedding anniversary, and on Facebook he posted a picture of his hand captioning it. I've been wearing this ring for a year now. I imagine today being a lot different. Eric said that life in Arkansas was unbearable to him and his family, so they gave up everything they had here to find a more peaceful setting. Anyone with information about the killing of Samantha Olson should call the North Little Rock Police Department's hotline for this case at 501-680-8439. All calls will be kept confidential. As we approach July 20th, 2018, it will make the 40th anniversary of the disappearance of Mary Jimmy Shin, known as Bobo throughout the town. Mary was born January 11th in 1953. She was referred to by her nickname of Bobo. She was a lover of the arts and everyone who remembers her adored her. She was creative, smart, caring, and had an altogether great personality. Growing up, she was a Girl Scout, a band member, and a high school honors. Mary Shin was 25 years old and grew up in Magnolia, Arkansas her whole life. Her father was a real estate developer, and her mother loved the theater. Her father owned many hotels in the area, so the Shins were pretty well off. One of her friends remembers making up a fun song that they would often sing, We'll have fun, fun, fun until Daddy takes the checkbook away. At her memorial, her friend mentioned this, ending with, and he did. Mary owned her own art studio after she graduated from Southern Arkansas University with a degree in studio art. Mary was an art teacher and gave lessons at her studio. Since she grew up around real estate, she wanted to purchase a house to fix up and sell. Mary bought a small house on East McNeil Street, fixed it up, and listed it in the classifieds for sale. Her ad read, Beginner's Delight, two-bedroom house completely remodeled in a good location. After several days of the ad running on July 19, 1978, a male called her about the home she was selling and asked to view the property. She met with the man on that day around 4 p.m. The male told Mary that he wanted to trade a parcel of land that he owned out on the Tyler Highway for the property she was selling. She told a few friends that she was interested in the offer, possibly for her boyfriend. She never mentioned the guy's name to anyone, though. The next day, Mary went about her normal business. She held an art class at the studio and went on a walk with her friends. Around 11 a.m., she received a call from the same man. He told her that he wanted to see the property again, but there was an issue with his car and it was being worked on at the dealership on Main Street. He said he planned to take a cab to the house Mary owned and said he'd call her right back. As soon as she hung up, the phone rang almost immediately. This time it wasn't the mail, it was Mary's friend Anita. Mary and Anita both met through their boyfriends and they hung out a lot at the pool at one of her father's properties after her morning art class. 
She told Anita that she was expecting a call from someone who might want to trade his property plus cash for hers. Anita told her to call her back and let her know. When the man called Mary back, she told him that he could walk across the street to the Easy Mart and she'll pick him up there. Mary then called Anita back and told her that she'd meet her around 1.30 if she was done. And prior to hanging up the phone, she joked with Anita, Come looking for me if I'm not back this afternoon. She giggled and hung up the phone. When Mary didn't come home from dinner that night, her mom started to worry. It wasn't like Mary to not show up for dinner without telling someone. Her mother immediately started worrying and went out looking for her. First, Sue contacted all of Mary's friends who told her mother about the mysterious man. She checked at the Jordan Brothers dealership where the mysterious man's car was being worked on. They told her that they didn't see Bubbo or any cars that he didn't recognize. Sue then went across the street to the Easy Mart. The worker from the car dealership said that he locked up and drove past Smitty's Grocery, where he spotted what he thought was the car that he sold Bobo. He pulled up next to the car and decided to get out and investigate if it was hers. He opened the door and opened the middle console. Inside, he found a piece of paper that had Mary's name on it. He put the paper back and shut the middle console and he said he went straight to Sue's house to tell her that he found Mary's car. Sue contacted the authorities, and State Trooper Ron Stovall arrived at the scene to investigate. Her car was found in the parking lot of Smitty's Grocery Store, where the employees said that they first saw the car around 1 p.m., but it wasn't officially found or reported until about 5 or 6. Her 1976 Blue Buick Special was left unlocked with the keys inside. The trooper felt the situation didn't seem right, so he contacted investigators for Magnolia and Columbia County, and then the state police criminal investigator, Russell Welch. They all began the investigation immediately. Ron Stovall said that he only worked on the case for a short amount of time. Even after 30 plus years though, he remembers that night clearly. He said that there were things about the car that caused them to believe that she would not have left it that way. They think some items may have been moved or touched, which usually occurs in a small town investigation in the 1970s. When they investigated, they found that her purse was dumped out onto the floorboard of her car. They immediately started thinking of this as an abduction. But two weeks after Bobo went missing, an officer admitted to knocking her purse over while searching the car. They do have photos of the interior and exterior of the car from when they investigated it. In the photos, you'll see a copy of the Thornbirds and a pair of women's sunglasses on the front passenger seat. Bobo's navy blue purse was left in the car with its contents spread out on the floorboard. Her tennis shoes were pushed up under the gas and brake pedal. There was also some grass inside the floorboard and deep scratches in the paint on the rear left fender. Her wallet was still in her purse with a small amount of cash, but her address book was missing. It seems that the culprit took the address book because it possibly contained information. The police said that the vehicle showed signs of being driven through a hay meadow because there was grass in the doors as if they had opened the door in the hay meadow and shut it, cutting the grass off. He said it could have also been driven through a wooded area, causing the scratches. Sheriff Lowe joined the investigation about a year after her disappearance. He feels like the investigators were chasing bad leads. He said that her tennis shoes appeared as if they were casually slipped off and she was driving in socks or bare feet. It appears that she was pretty comfortable with whoever she was in the car with. Whoever drove her car to the parking lot didn't bother to remove the shoes from behind the pedals. The car was processed and they tried really hard to find anything. They collected a few hairs and partial fingerprints, but they both came back to be females and they're pretty sure that they're Bobos. Investigators questioned everyone in town about the last time that they saw Mary. There was a carpenter working across the street from Mary's property, and they asked him about that day. He said that he can't remember the exact time, but it would be between 11.30 and 12, when he saw Bobo and a man at the home. He first saw a blue car pull up from the east, and then a green car pull up from the west. He said a bearded man got out of the vehicle and went into the home with Bobo. They both exited the home around 15 minutes later, getting into their cars and separately, but both in the same direction, down McNeil Street. But there was a problem with his story. It didn't match up with what Bobo told her friends. 
She told him that she was going to pick him up because his car was being worked on. There were witnesses that saw the man get into Bobo's car at the Easy Mart. Could the carpenter be confusing the days? If that's the case, then the timeline still wouldn't match. The carpenter was working on the roof of the house across the street and had pretty thick glasses. The guy who lived next door to Bobo's house drove a green car and came home for lunch around 11.30. So it's possible that it was the neighbor and the house that he entered was his own. The carpenter, though, stood by his story and was sure that it wasn't the neighbor. The police figured that it was a mix-up when they were looking for a bearded man in a green car and saw the neighbor. They said that around 11 a.m. on July 20th, an unknown male came into the store to get changed to use the payphone. They said that he went outside and talked on the phone for about five minutes. They described him as a white male in his mid or late 20s, around 5 foot 8 inches and 185 to 200 pounds. They said that he had dark curly hair and was heavy built and slightly overweight. Another witness statement that sticks with Sheriff Lowe is from a man who is no longer alive. Henry was the Columbia County Assessor and he saw the reports of Bobo being missing in the pictures of her car. He contacted the investigators two days after she went missing. Henry was out bailing hay around noon on a gravel road just west of Highway 132. He noticed a blue car, almost identical to Bobo's car, drive by on Columbia 32 with a male and a female inside who appeared to be struggling. He stated that the car was swerving from side to side, but only traveling 10 to 20 miles per hour. That became the main area of interest and still is. During that summer, they continued to search and started conducting aerial searches. They spotted a green car in the woods south of Magnolia. When the investigator arrived, he forced his way into the car and the trunk looking for Bobo's body or any signs of her. The car was registered to Bill Holmes, who had reported the car stolen two weeks after Bobo's disappearance. Bill was pretty pissed off that they forced themselves into the vehicle. He went as far as taking the issue to court and he asked, are they going to tear up every green car that they see? Investigators were becoming desperate for anything. They gave polygraph tests and hypnotized others in hopes to find anything, knowing in the back of their head none of it would be admissible in court but they were just desperate to find Mary. They even went as far as contacting a psychic. It was falsely reported that Mary was a real estate agent. So anytime there was a murder involving a real estate agent, no matter where, they would make a call to the investigators. The calls coming in would include the investigators that were handling the murders of Robert Zaney, who was a psychopath that preyed on real estate agents in the late 1970s in Texas and Oklahoma. They had no evidence that Zaney had been near Magnolia in 1978, so this theory trickled to nothing. They received many confessions from people who were not all there, including a female who confessed to participating in multiple crimes throughout the South. In April 1980, Betty Middleton waived extradition to Columbia County to be questioned about her claim that she was involved in Bobo's disappearance. Investigators said that she gave information that she has knowledge of circumstances surrounding the case. They spent hours upon hours contacting over 200 people and searching the various areas while checking out Betty's claim. She claimed she accompanied her boyfriend to Arizona, where they buried Mary. Investigators were not able to find the body in the location that she claimed, and they could never prove that Betty ever had a boyfriend. Further investigation found that she had news articles in her home on Mary's disappearance. Another confession that they received was from none other than Henry Lee Lucas. The problem with this confession is Lucas is known for confessing to multiple murders to receive special treats while on death row. They were unable to find any indication that Lucas was in or even near Arkansas in 1978. In October, the Arkansas State Police reduced the number of investigators working on the case from six to one. Russell Welch was the investigator that remained on Bobo's case. He says of all the cases he's worked on, Bobo's was the most pressing. He said that they received far more than 300 leads that all went nowhere. Mary's family, frustrated, started hiring their own private investigators, including Bill Gray from Louisiana. Bill says that the tip line that the family set up was originally receiving hundreds of calls, but after a week, the numbers were down to 10 to 15 calls a day. He also made the statement that there was way too much planning. 
this couldn't be an abduction from someone random. Not long, the family replaced Gray with a private investigator from Texas named William Deere. Deere, known for solving the disappearance of the teenage genius James Dallas Egbert II in the early 1980s, found himself facing a huge challenge, a case way different than his other cases. Deere said that he set up at the Coachman Inn, one of Shin's hotels, and found that his usual tricks for recovering any information possible were not working. Usually he can offer money to individuals in a small town and someone will talk. He said he would offer people half and tell them that they'll receive the other half once the information checks out. He also had a difficult time working with the local law enforcement there. He said typically he works well with law enforcement just fine and has even been inducted to the National Policeman's Hall of Fame. But things were really different in Magnolia, Arkansas. He received the cold shoulder and often when he'd go back to talk to people, they would tell him that they'd been instructed not to speak with him. The local law enforcement denies all claims. Deere stated that within a month of his arrival, he had a viable suspect, Michael G. Morse. Michael was 27 years old, and on October 15, 1978, just months after Bobo's disappearance, Michael committed suicide in the woods. Further investigation into Michael, he found that he not only matched the description given by the carpenter, but his boss said that he called in on July 20, 1978, stating that he had to meet with someone in Magnolia about a house for sale. It turns out that he was schizophrenic and under the care of an El Dorado psychiatrist and on antipsychotic drugs. He also believed that he was Jesus Christ. Deer began receiving statements from witnesses saying Michael claimed to have information on Bobo's disappearance more than once. Deer took a photo of Michael Morse to the carpenter and asked if he noticed the man. The carpenter identified the photo as the man that he saw arrive with Bobo at the house on McNeil Street. The carpenter wrote a statement to Deer dated November 20, 1979. On November 12, 1979, I was shown several photographs of different male subjects by William C. Deer and Associates of Dallas, Texas. At this time, I voluntarily state that I have positively, without a doubt, identified a photograph of one Michael G. Morse as being the male subject I saw with Miss Shin in the 700 block of East McNeil Street in Magnolia, Arkansas at about 11.30 a.m. on July 20th, 1978. The statement was presented to Sheriff Lowe. He doesn't believe someone can positively identify someone they saw for only a few minutes over a year later. I personally disagree. With as much media as the case had, I could easily see someone remembering that face and never forgetting. Arkansas State Investigator agrees with Sheriff Lowe that it's impossible to remember the face a year later. Regardless of what law enforcement believed, Deere is convinced, still 30 years later, that Morse is the culprit in Bobo's disappearance. He also believes that she is buried in the woods near where Morse was found after he committed suicide, a location where Morse was planning to build his church. On December 12, 1980, prosecuting attorney Mike Kennard discredited Deere's evidence and claimed that they would not be able to prosecute the case because he cannot prove a crime was committed and they cannot prove that Michael committed the crime without a reasonable doubt. The investigators for the state said that they investigated the Morse theory and found no evidence pinning him to the disappearance. Russell Welch claims Morse was questioned after they received a tip, but Welch said that there wasn't a reason to further investigate him. Welch claims that Morse had an alibi. He just cannot remember what it was. Lowe was quoted saying, This has gotten political and I have nothing more to say of it, calling it a game of political football. In November 1979, they exhumed Morse's father, who died a few weeks prior to Bobo's disappearance. A nurse who worked for Morse's psychiatrist stated that she overheard Morse claim the body was buried with his father. The nurse was scared for her safety and did not want to be named for the tip. Deer told law enforcement that a psychic gave them the information which created a bigger mess than they already had. Lowe claims that they were not involved in exhuming Morse Sr., but Deere says that there were at least five law enforcement present. The Morse family allowed Deere to exhume the body, and nothing was found, 
Later, the widow of Michael Morse and his mother, Corin Morse, filed a $2 million lawsuit in Columbia County against William Deere and his associate, Sammy Tayton. The lawsuit claimed emotional distress and innovation of privacy for naming Morse a suspect in the case. Tragically, Corinne Morse was killed in an automobile accident, and the damages were then reduced to $1 million. Right before the trial began, Sammy was dismissed from the lawsuit, leaving William Deere the only defendant. During all this, the Shins family stuck right by Deere's side. The jury returned a verdict in Deere's favor, and he returned back to Texas. He continues to receive calls and letters about Bobo's disappearance. He files all of the tips in her case. He hopes that one day the state investigators will agree that Morse was allegedly involved in Mary Bobo's disappearance. Deere said that he recently got information from someone on a new lead based off things that the person seen and heard. Deere gave them a polygraph and questioned them and found that the information could be helpful. He sent the sheriff an email about it and the county prosecutor responded saying send all information to them. Deere said he's decided to search the property himself, but nothing has been done. Over the years, Sheriff Lowe and investigators continued to unsuccessfully dig up sites in Columbia County and a few in the neighboring counties. It's shocking that after all these years, so little information has surfaced, almost 40 years from the date she disappeared. Sheriff Lowe says DNA is still being submitted to the FBI in hopes that they will find something. He is also re-interviewing past witnesses and continues to search for her or any info that will lead to finding her remains. Although she has been declared legally dead and her parents have passed, there still needs to be closure for her siblings, her friends, and the community. If you have any information about this case, please contact Columbia County Sheriff's Office at 870-234-5331. Next week on Strictly Homicide, I'll be continuing the cold case series with a few more cases that need to be heard. Today's promos are from Twisted Philly, Can We Cold, and Murderish. Strictly Homicide is written and hosted by me, Nikki T. The original music and production is done by Mr. T. No, not that one. My Mr. T. If you've enjoyed the show, please remember to tell a friend and rate and review us on iTunes. You can also help support the show on Patreon. Just search for Strictly Homicide Podcast. If there is a case that you would like us to discuss, or if you have any comments or corrections, please send us an email at strictlyhomicide at yahoo.com or contact us on social media. Please visit our website at strictlyhomicide.com where you can find links to all our social media, Patreon page, merchandise, and a button for one-time donations. For news on the podcast and pictures from the episodes I cover, you can find our Facebook page, discussion group, and Instagram by searching for Strictly Homicide Podcast. And on Twitter, at Strictly Homicide with no O. That's S-T-R-I-C-T-L-Y-H-M-I-C-I-D-E. Stick around to hear a few promos from my favorite podcasts. And until next time, y'all stay safe, especially you, Arkansas. You don't have to be from Philadelphia to love the Twisted Philly podcast. There's more mischief, mayhem, and nefarious goings-on in the city of brotherly love than Billy Penn could have ever imagined. We've got it all here on the Twisted Philly Podcast. Hi, I'm Dina Marie, the host of Twisted Philly. Join me every week for some of my favorite stories from the city of brotherly love and sisterly affection. We'll talk about true crime, haunted history, legends and local lore, plus some of my most favorite places to visit all around Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. You can follow me on social media, on Facebook at The Twisted Philly Podcast, and on Twitter at Twisted underscore Philly. And you can find my show on all major podcast apps. Plus, if you're a Patreon supporter, you get access to exclusive content twice a month that isn't available to other listeners. Join me every week in Twisted Philly. Hey, Meg. 
Are you terrified when you see a large group of people dressed in the exact same outfit? Usually. Al, are you strangely intrigued by the idea of wearing linen to appease alien overlords? Mm Mm-hmm. Do you find yourself sucked in by documentaries about cults from the 70s? Absolutely. Do you like your podcasts with wild but educated speculation? If you've answered yes to any of these questions, check out Can We Cult? Hosted by me, Allie. And me, Megan. We're two cheap wine aficionados slash best friends living in Portland, Oregon. Sure, we have some formal training and we do work in social services, but we got our real knowledge about cults from documentaries, books, Reddit threads, and again, wild speculation. Every Thursday, a new episode full of scary, sad, and hilarious stories with a whole lot of heart is released. You can check us out on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and Overcast, as well as on all social media platforms at Can We Cult. Join Join us, won't you? Hey everyone, I'm Jamie, and I host a podcast called Murderish, which takes you inside stories of murder and other creepy events. The first episode of Murderish lets listeners be a fly on the wall for a first-degree murder trial. The story is told from a juror's perspective as I was that juror. If you are a true crime junkie and need to know every detail, you'll feel right at home with this podcast. Follow Murderish on Twitter at Murderish Pod and on Facebook at Murderish Podcast. And don't worry, this doesn't mean you're a murderer. It just means you're murder-ish.